so I had the good fortune before I moved back to Australia last year to be the director of a research museum at UC Berkeley, the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology. And the work I'll just briefly tell you about today uh, developed from that time. And that led me to a lot of thinking about, you know, what's the, the place of a museum in, in the 21st century? And I have to say it's an incredibly exciting time to be a collections-oriented researcher, whether you're in a museum or, or a university or CSIRO. And that's because of the, sort of the confluence of different lines of evidence that we can now bring to bear on interesting questions in evolution, ecology, conservation, biology. The traditional area of museums is accumulating specimens, as, as you mentioned, for you know, taxonomically oriented research, perhaps ecologically oriented uh, research. Um, and you know, with them, the phenotypes, the traits, the ecologically relevant phenotypic characteristics and so forth. And of course, phylogeny also in, in modern systematics is, is absolutely central. The growth area in our science is not so much in the number of specimens, but the other data we can connect with it. So we have genomic data, which is you know, from the Human Genome Project and other sources. We have this vast array of new technologies. And as I'll show you, we can now get genome scale data out of museum skins. Imagine what that opens up for your collections. I'll come back to that. And environmental data. We're getting increasingly sophisticated, fine-grained environmental data across space and time, from remote sensing, from global uh, climate models, or local climate um, interpolations of climates from those, vegetation distributions, and so on. So potentially, we can connect this. Every, every specimen has a place and a time. And particularly if you have field notes with it, then you have a much richer set of data. So that's my sort of theme. And that, that gives museums quite unanticipated potential in addressing important societal questions. So my story centers around this, this fellow, Joseph Grinnell, who is one of the er prominent early 20th century ecologists and evolutionary biologists. He was the founder of the museum I was at in Berkeley. And he wrote an amazing paper in 1910 on the uses of a natural history museum as he was setting up the Museum of Vertebrate Zoology. And it included this, this statement in a longer paragraph. But he could already see the, the dramatic environmental change occurring in California and wanted to establish a record to which people could return 100 years hence and see the impact of environmental change on California's diversity. Pretty cool. So when I got there as director, it was a no-brainer to do what Joseph Grinnell told us to do, but I also particularly like this quote from an undergrad who we had taking some potential donors around the museum, which is specimen is like a good book. You can read it again and again and get new things out of it. And that's certainly the case. So the story is centered around California, a sort of an exemplar of what I think we can do. And Grinnell was, fortunately for us, was particularly interested in diversity across environmental gradients and the distributions of species and their congeners, their related species, across steep environmental gradients. And from this, he developed the concept of ecological niches in 1917. But it included things like um, very dense sampling of birds and mammals, the specimens, and so forth, across these steep environmental gradients from, say, the Central Valley of California, Central Valley up over the Sierra Nevada crest up to uh, about three, three to 4,000 meters, uh, and then dropping down into the Great Basin and Mojave Deserts on the other side. But he had these sort of transects that he ran in Northern California, Central Sierra, Southern Sierra, as well as all up and down the coast, and around his hometown of Los Angeles in the San Bernardino Mountains. So he did actually have an ecological question in mind, and these are what we now call gradsecs, uh, sampling transects across deep environmental gradients. Now, there's been spatially patchy climate change in California over that time. Some areas have got warmer, shown in red here. Some areas have actually cooled off a little bit. Some areas have got a bit wetter. Some have got, in particular in the south, have got drier. So although we see the global averages of temperature change, we have to remember that it's spatially really variable depending on the climate system and the drivers of that. So the thing that made this possible is the, he was an early bioinformatician. He did biodiversity informatics before the word existed. So he had his collecting maps. He had very detailed field notes, and that's a, a process that we've continued in the museum to the current day. We teach it to our students, how to take good field notes, record what you did, how you did it, what you got, what you were thinking about, what you had for breakfast. It's all in this stuff. 
So this is just an example. Here's some specimens. Here's uh, the, some trapping details. There's ecological observations there, and we've got tens of thousands of pages of this stuff. A lot of museums have this stuff, but they haven't necessarily prioritised making it available and usable. But it's really the key to what we're able to do. So this Grinnell Resurvey project was hypothesis-free research. It was great. We just wanted to go see what's changed, why, can that help us predict the future? And importantly, create another benchmark, particularly for the mammals, small mammals. We recollected everything, even in national parks. We went hell-bent for leather with their support, their strong support, to obtain another physical snapshot of the diversity to which people can come back again 25, 50 years down the road. Collecting remains really, really important. We weren't able to do that with the birds. There was just, just running around with a shotgun on your assembly and shooting birds just wasn't going to happen. So you point out that you know, there are vagaries and uncertainties in using the museum data. Museum data can be used, but with great statistical care. And we were fortunate having the historical trapping records so we knew how they obtained the specimens, how many they got each night, how many traps they put out and where. Now, you don't always have that. But if you do, then you can apply these, uh, they're called occupancy models. Basically, they correct for detectability. If the animal's there, how lucky are you to find it, given your sampling effort? Or conversely, if it's there, how likely are you to miss it with a probability of false absence? And particularly if you're studying shifts in range boundaries as we were, it really helps to know that. You can get away without it, but your inference is much stronger if you know it. So this is an example of elevational plots from zero to 3,000 metres here for uh, Yosemite. The grey spots are all the... Uh, so at the bottom, H, are the historic sampling sites, uh, the modern sampling sites on the top row. The black dots are where, we, uh, where specimens were collected of this particular species, historically, early 20th century and now. The green dots are where they just shot animals. So there's no trapping effort associated with that, just a gun. <coughs> given that, given you know, how detectable they are in a single survey and then over multiple nights and then across sites, you can get a, a a good statistical estimate of range shifts that you can support and have confidence in. And this is uh, the probability of occupancy across elevation from historic to present. And you can see an upward shift there of about 500 metres. Um, and that's repeated in two independent transects. So that's one type of observation. Now, it's a lot of, normally I have four or five slides that lead you to this point, but time is short. So each bar here is, this is just from the Yosemite transect, each bar here is an individual species, elevation on the y-axis, and green is a statistically significant range expansion, red is a significant range contraction. So you can see here we have a bunch of mostly low elevation species, this one translocating upwards, so it's gone from the lower part of its range, it's now present on the upper part of its range, Likewise with this one. This one, which is a shrew that likes wet meadows, has expanded downwards. So not everything's going up, some's going up, some's coming down. The high elevation tax, we see a bunch of species that are suffering range collapse or upward range contraction. And again, for many of these, that's repeated across independent transects, like I showed you in the previous slide. The kicker is we have all these other tax, including some closely related species, that are not changing. They're often across the same habitats. They're the same genus. One chipmunk versus another chipmunk, one field mouse versus another field mouse, that are not suffering that range contraction or, or expansion. Why is that? Short answer is, we don't know. So how can we make predictions about future vulnerability if we don't know that? And we've tried to predict it from species traits, life history, hibernation status, body size, diet, all that stuff. And it, we can predict range expansions, they're the weedy species. We can't predict the range contractions, and they're the ones we're most worried about. So, what else can we do with museum specimens to help with that? The real thing you have to do is get in the field, study the autocology, study the physiology, reproductive rates, disease, all the things that might be physiology that might be causing these contractions. That's really hard work, and I don't like hard work. 
So can we use museum specimens to help focus the hypotheses on what makes some species more sensitive than others? And I think we can, so you know, really the hard work is down here. You've got to get out in the field and actually measure what's going on in declining and non-declining species. But there's a couple of things we can pick out of museum specimens. Of course, they're great at phenotypes. And phenotypes tell you a lot about ecology and changes in ecology. So you can do something about that, including isotopes. And we can also look, as I'll show you, at genomes and see what's changing. So just one example, this is the, the chipmunk I showed you before. This axis is body size, essentially, from historic to modern, they're getting bigger. So species that are contracting individually are getting bigger. Kind of surprised me. We see the same thing in ground squirrels. The contracting ones are getting bigger, the stable ones are not changing. What's that about? It suggests that nutritional limitation is not causing the decline. Right? Perhaps. So, and then you can do more detailed stuff. You know, uh, mammal skulls tell you a lot about ecology. The way it's getting bigger is not overall size increase, it's extension of the rostrum. And in mammals, the rostrum has uh, nasal membranes that help retain water. So perhaps this is something to do with resistance to desiccation. Again, it's just a hypothesis, it's not proven. We can do carbon, nitrogen, et al. stable isotopes and look for shifts in diet. So we've got, um, you can see shifts in, uh, from you know, what, one form of diet to another along either of these axes. Oh, and I didn't, put the <laughs> I didn't put the data slide in. What it shows, if you close your eyes and imagine it, is in the declining species, there's a consistent shift down this direction from uh, high nitrogen 15 to low nitrogen 15, suggesting we're getting to more legume-dominated climates. That doesn't necessarily, and the non-declining species are shifting, but at random, with respect to isotope space. So maybe even if nutrition not limiting, there's a diet change. Is that causative? We have no idea, they're just hypotheses. Now, as I mentioned, I'm a geneticist. So I mentioned what can we mine out of museum specimens in terms of genetics, and this is nothing new. We've used museum specimens, dried specimens, alcohol-preserved specimens to do genetics for a long time, but typically on a very small scale. So what you might expect is if the species that the alpine chipmunk formerly had this range along the Sierra Crest, fairly large connected populations, and then as it's moved up the mountains and out of the meadows, you get isolation on different mountain peaks, you expect a decrease in overall diversity and an increased genetic difference between populations. So again, we can look at the historic specimens on the left, on the left, rather, uh, and the modern specimens on the right. This is with just a handful of microsatellite loci. It's really painful work. You've got to do lots and lots of replication. It's, it's almost killed a PhD student. But she saw what we expected to see, a decline in diversity, increase in among population divergence in the declining species, but not the co-occurring stable species. So that's hard evidence that there's a change in genetic diversity, a change in population structure, accompanying, uh, or as predicted by these pretty spatial models, which are just models, they're not the truth, they're just models. So that's cool. What really excites me now is we can do this with skins. So using uh, sequence capture techniques and next-gen sequencing, as they do in, for Neanderthals, for example. In fact, the methods we use were developed in Parbo's lab for Neanderthals. If you can do a Neanderthal, by God, you can do a, a, a mouse skin or a chipmunk skin. So we, in effect, the DNA is perfect for next-gen sequencing. For those who aren't in the, the know, it, next gen, the modern next-gen sequencing methods work with very short DNA fragments, 100 base pairs. And normally you have to take your DNA and shear it up at random into little tiny pieces to sequence it. Well, guess what? Museum skins come like that anyway. There's plenty of DNA, but it's all sheared in little tiny random short fragments. It's perfect for next-gen sequencing albeit with some DNA damage that you can detect and take out bioinformatically. So we can do this. These are plots across 10,000 loci of allele frequency in the modern versus the historic on this axis. This is two declining populations. You can see a fair spread there off the diagonal. So that's presumably more drift, uh, more fragmentation of populations, 
And we see that fragmentation go from historic to modern, as we did for the microsatellites. But also you can spot some outliers, and the stats behind this is still ongoing, but all these spots here, an increase in frequency and a gene to do with oxidative stress. So again, that suggests a hypothesis. Perhaps there's physiological limitation uh, over this 100 generation or so time uh, associated with the declining species. And for the stable species, you can see a much tighter relationship and uh, no strong outliers. So I guess my point is that, yes, museums are very relevant. They have to be used with care. Grinnell wasn't thinking about climate change. He was thinking, well, maybe there's going to be environmental change. So the uses of museums are often unanticipated, as are the types of questions we can ask with them. Museum collections, properly created museum collections are gold. They're the only source of evidence we have as to history, and we need to use them. Thank you.